Natalie Douglas has won an impressive seven Mac Awards, a Nightlife Award, a Backstage Bistro Award, and has played in nearly every room in New York City. Her soaring vocals and diverse song selection can make you laugh in one minute and cry in the next. She's a storyteller who uses music to express her thoughts on love, loss, and liberation. As Natalie is about to embark on some exciting first, I caught up with her to reflect on her incredible journey. Well, here we are at Birdland. This is like your your second home. Mm -hmm. It is. I'm very fortunate. What does this What does this place mean to you? Um. It, well, it has always loomed large. I mean, of course, I grew up hearing about it and learning about it and knowing about it, and um, never dreamt that I would have the pleasure of singing here. And so, it's been my home for um, eight years. And Johnny and Jim Caruso and the entire amazing staff here, Johnny Valenti, the owner, um, just make me feel at home. They take really good care of me, and and they know how to throw a really good party, you know. Which brings me up to you recently celebrated a birthday. Yes, I did. <laughs> and it was here, mm -hmm. correct? You had yes. this party. No, no, I I came. I I had last year. I had a big birthday show. Uh -huh. and we had a party, and um, and that was actually a few days before my party, my birthday. This past year, which was last week, mm -hmm. um, I. Um, uh, had, I, it, I was here on my birthday, um, but we didn't have a party for me. We actually came to see a great singer, Stephen Wallum, a terrific actor and singer, who was doing the 7 o'clock show here, Jim's Broadway at Birdland series. Um, Stephen Storr on Nurse Jackie, and he and I did a review together, and I just adore him. And, and so we came to that show and hung out for a little bit and got to hug a bunch of people I enjoy and see them on my birthday, and then we ran off to dinner because we were starving. <laughs> so it was a good birthday. It was then. a great birthday. Oh, it was wonderful. Right. Yeah. And this room in particular is important because you record a live CD. I did. I did. Um, mm -hmm. To Nina. Mm -hmm. So I want to talk a little bit about Nina. Okay. What does she mean to you? Oh, wow. Um, well, again, I grew up listening to her. I guess she was a presence in my life um, because she was all about joy, all about passion, all about the music. Um, and this, each story that she told, whether it was you know a French language song, or an, a traditional spiritual, or something on the radio, something new and hip that she was covering, um, she got inside it and told this really personal story about it that made you hear it in a whole different way. It, even uh, something like um, the Bee Gees, To Love Somebody. You know, that her version of that, He's freaky. I mean, it's fierce. Uh, 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 Screaming Jay Hawkins, I put a spell on you. Nina spell, sh oh, sends ch shivers up and down your spine. You know, it, everything about the way she approached a tune just excited me from, because I'm, I'm always drawn to both the musical and the lyrical or, or, you know, the word element. I'm drawn to both of those things. And so somebody who really uses both to make you feel something will always grab me. You know, just get me right by the heart. And you know, she is arguably one of the greatest voices in the civil rights yeah, movement. Yeah, absolutely. And you have always been outspoken yes. about equal rights. And yes. I want to read something. Um, we talked about your birthday. Mm -hmm. And then on Facebook, yes. you thanked people yes, for their birthday wishes. And you went on to thank many people. Mm -hmm. And you said, thank you, Martin Luther King, for fighting the good fight, even though you knew it was a death sentence. Thank you, civil rights, women's rights, LGBT rights, and immigrants' rights, activists everywhere for seeing the bigger picture and believing in the possible. And thank you, President Obama, for making a truly inclusive and progressive inaugural speech. This is my president. Mm -hmm. So uh, all of this is very important to you. Mm -hmm. yeah. You've always been outspoken about it. Yeah. Why is it so important to you? Um, I, I, well, it seems like I keep giving you the same answer, but it's how I grew up. Okay. Um, my politics was, in a way, the family business. My uh, godfather, who was also my cousin, was the mayor of Los Angeles. And um, I grew up in politics and knowing political people, and my family was very active. And one of my earliest memories is my mother sort of taking me around with her to knock on doors. Um, and, and pass out you know, information. Um, I think she figured that an adorable toddler would get them to open the door. Did it work? <laughs> yes, okay. yes. Um, and, and so, uh, and I, I mean, I really had a sense growing up that um, you, know, you have an obligation uh, uh, when you're taking up space on this planet to care about somebody who isn't you. You know, that, that 
it, um, Fannie Lou Hamer, who is a great civil rights activist, um, is starting out as a, you know, a, a sharecropper, um, used to say, um, nobody's free till everybody's free. And, and I believed that, and I was raised to believe that. That's how my parents thought. And um, my, my mom was getting her PhD when I was little, uh, so she was going back to college much later in life. But my experience of adults in my early years was this fabulous mosaic of people of different ages and different races and different backgrounds and coming from different places and they'd all come over to, to my parents house and they played bridge or they hung out and they watched TV and they listened to music and they you know but being raised an only child I was allowed to hang with the, the adults and listen to them talk and they debated things and they talked about things and and they were all clearly valuable to my parents there they weren't you know they didn't treat people differently because they were gay or straight or white or black or Asian or Jewish. And I loved that. I, I loved, I grew up in a neighborhood that was a third black, a third Asian, a third Jewish. In Los I, Angeles. In Los Angeles, yes. I went to private schools um, and I had a lot of blessings. Mm -hmm. So I think if you are lucky enough to be fortunate, um, then you have an even greater obligation to care about injustice that's done. And, and it, that's not to say there isn't injustice, you know, if you have material things. It's just that it all matters. And, and I think sort of being alive is a political act. That's my perspective. I know a lot of people don't think that way, but I think it is because every choice that you make, you know, says something about who you are in the world and, and where you fit in and where you see other people fitting in. And I think musically, those two things go together really well because in all of these circumstances that you wouldn't necessarily think, all of these causes and struggles, there were people who were singing. You know, there are songs of the civil rights movement. There are songs of women's rights. Um, Which is like your show, Freedom Song. Yes, yes. In that, we actually found a song from 18, I think it was 1869, um, uh, from a women's suffrage uh, conference. Um, where they repurposed the song My Country Tis of Thee and wrote new lyrics to it um, to pass out to the women um, who were coming to this conference to talk about getting women to vote. Uh, I love that. I love that people found a way to use music to further their goal and to unite their, their cause, the members, you know, in, in support of the cause. And, and music has a lot of really cool purposes. Um, it touches us, you know. And your childhood, which you touched on, then mm -hmm. as you became a teenager, your first paying gig was at a steakhouse <laughs> at yes. 17 years old. <laughs> now, what do you remember about this steakhouse? <laughs> oh, God. What did you sing? Oh, everything. For people at a steakhouse. Everything. It was a very odd little gig. It was this steakhouse in a, in a, a tower in Westwood. So it was up on, if not the very top floor, near the top floor. And... Uh, there was a guitar player who had the gig, it was his gig. And I used to go in and I don't even, I think he was a friend of a friend. And he would ask me occasionally, because he knew that I sang, you know, to stand up and sing something with him. Like, hey Natalie, come, you know, sing a harmony or sing lead on this. And, and I've always known song, like they've always been in my head. Um, so I would sing Blue by You. I would sing, you know, I would just sing things. And sometimes he'd get requests for things he didn't really know, and he'd look over at me and ask me. And after a while, the manager um, started, you know, asking me to, to make sure I was there on Sunday. And, you know, I think it was, oh God, was it 25 bucks in dinner that he would give me? I can't, hey, you know. You can't beat it. But, <laughs> hey, that was good money That's for a 17-year-old, right. you know. But, um, not really. But, but. but but I got to do what I loved, right. and it was fun. Uh -huh. I had a blast, yeah. and I met a lot of people. And and one time, it was very exciting. Um, we had a request, and I can't remember now what the song was, but we had a request for something, and I said, "Oh yeah, I know that." And and we started to sing it, and the gent who had requested it came over and said, "Oh, you were terrific. I love it." And he gave me and the guitar player each a hundred dollars. Extra money than the dinner. Yes, the, uh, just, you know, this was our tip. You were terrific. And I was kind of like, oh my God, I am going to do this for the rest of my life. That's, that's right. all there's to yeah. well, And then you came to visit some friends, mm -hmm. uh, your girlfriends here in New York, and the moment you 
got into New York, you said, wow, this is, this is my home. Yeah. It's so what was it about New York? Oh, God. Uh, the f well, I came here in the fall, which, yeah. let's be honest, that's one of the most, I mean, fall and spring in New York. Stunning. Gorgeous. You know, um, I also was such a huge fan of old movies and, you know, I was that kid. I was the vintage kid. Um, that I already had a love for New York before I ever got here. You know, I used to say that I wanted to come here. And my father, who's really funny and an odd man, used to say, um, it hadn't been any good since World War II. You know? <laughs> but, you know, this is a man who grew up in Texas and saw the world um, when, during World War II, when he was, you know, stationed around and traveled. And, and then settled in Los Angeles and didn't really want to go anywhere else. Like, he, he loved L.A. and he was perfectly happy there. Um, Times Square is a bit different than World yes, War II days. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. My daddy never came here. And yeah. when he was alive, he never came to visit me. My mother came once. Okay. But, um, yeah, he, he had no interest. But I was always attracted to New York. So I was excited and looking forward to seeing it. I mean, I was primed, you know. Yeah. Um, and I got here and went for a walk on the Upper West Side. There was a mystery bookstore. Uh, I think it was one of the offshoots of Foul Play. Might have been Mysterious Bookshop, I don't remember which one. But it's one that's no longer there. Um, but it was on 89th Street in the first floor of a brownstone. And I walked inside, and I'm a, I'm a book freak, I love books, I'm a reading history freak. I'm a nerd. And, uh, the, you know, I was wa looking at all the books, and looking at all the people, and there were cats sitting around in the store that would let you, and I was just like, this is the best place I've ever been. <laughs> and I left and went to Riverside Park and sat and read my book and thought, I am never leaving. And you haven't. Uh, basically. So. Uh, that was in, oh boy, that was in the fall of 86, 85 or 86. And, then and I moved here in 88. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. Sure. And our producer, Scott Barbarino, wanted mm -hmm. me to send his regards to you because he Scott. said that you two know each other from, yes. uh, from Piano Bar. Yeah, absolutely. Do you remember which one? Uh, oh boy. We, Scott knew Scott at 88. I knew Scott yeah. at Duplex when it was in the original location. And then yeah. Rose's Turn uh, and Broadway Baby. Oh. You mentioned Brandy's. Yes. And okay. Brandy. Yeah, I worked there a long All time. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, 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 at one time. When there were many piano bars, I had worked or subbed in every one of them. Uh -huh. um, one year, I think it was a Bistro Awards or the Mac Awards, they had me give out one of the piano bar uh, awards because I, I had worked in every one of them. You were like Miss Piano Bar. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> yeah. I think that was Scott, actually. <laughs> um, <laughs> No, um, but I want that to come out, <laughs> by the way. Sure, are taking it back. sure, sure, fight him for it. Um, no, <laughs> I, I it. loved it. Yeah, it was great training ground. Fantastic. Yeah. Uh, you have to sing for people who don't care. You have to yeah. sing for people who are yelling at you. You have to sing for people who you know uh, are having their own little party, but they really need you to be their the soundtrack to their yes. lives, you know. You have to sing for people who are giving you rapt attention and want to be blown away. You have to sing pop, you have to sing standards, you have to sing show tunes, you have to sing country, you have to take requests. Mm -hmm. And and to, you know, and I sort of created this, this um, mix of genealogy and cordiality, because I actually do like people, I think they're fun, but also with boundaries, because, <laughs> What was one of your boundaries? Oh, like I'm well, not singing that song. Well, it, I have. Uh, I, I, cre I created something called Wrong Black Girl because because <laughs> there was a certain kind of customer who would walk into the room and without hearing you sing a note, without you know knowing what your voice was like or what your style was, would say, "Oh, you have to sing what you used." To. You know, you have to sing Diana Ross. You ha and now, these are fantastic, brilliant women, but A, pick a song, and B, I do, I have to, because I have melanin, don't start with me. You know, like, it's, it's not genetic. I don't know every song every black girl ever sang. It's, I, I, that's just not how it works, you know. So, um, so, so that, that wrong sometimes. Wrong black girl. Wrong black girl. Wrong black girl. I don't, I don't Maybe know. you could put a show together. Actually, it's the name of <laughs> that they wanted me to say. Yes. It's actually the name of my production company. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because 
it just you know it, yeah. that um and well, what? but you know what's weird is that even songs that I don't necessarily love myself mm -hmm. when someone would ask for it and you could tell that they really loved it yeah and that it meant something to them and sometimes they would tell you the story about it you know my mom used to sing it to me it would become an absolute joy to sing it for them. Mm -hmm. It would really become a pleasure, you know. And I worked with fantastic musicians, Mark Hartman, David Budwell. I mean, the, it's still Mark. Hartman. Still Mark Hartman. Yes. yes. No, neither Mark nor I work in the bars anymore. But yeah, that's where we met. Um, well, so that that's the past, mm -hmm. and now you have this exciting couple of first coming up. I know. You are off to London. I am. For the first time, right? No, it's the first time I'm doing with a nightclub the back there. Yes. I was there in 2004 with the Mabel Mercer Cabaret Convention. Uh, I did two songs there and we were there for a week. And I had an amazing time and fell in yeah. love with that city. Uh, it, again, I am a freak for history. And um, so walking around in a place older than our entire country is exciting. Yeah. Um, uh, so I'm really looking forward to going back. And. Um, my best girlfriend and her dear husband and darling daughter uh, live there. They're from there and they had lived here for five years. We got to be very close and their little girl was born here and then they moved back. So um, that's going to be fantastic. We're going to get to And that. let's talk about your Carnegie Hall <gasps> debut. Yes, three days after I get back. I'm in London doing shows from the 11th through the 15th at the Crazy right. Cooks. And then uh, three days after I return, mm -hmm. I am making my Carnegie Hall debut with Michael Feinstein, who is a love. Um, he has this fantastic program called Standard Time with Michael Feinstein, and he does, uh, it's focused on different standards or different yeah. composers. This one is Jimmy Van Heusen and Sammy Kahn. Mm -hmm. um, brilliant, brilliant songwriters. And so it's songs that they each wrote with others, and then songs that they wrote together. Did you ever think that you would be at Carnegie Hall? I did in that, gosh, I hope that happens way. Right. And that, you know, the way that, like, all of us who have anything to do with this biz business picture ourselves, you know, we hold an Oscar. And, you know, <laughs> but, but I, I, it, it's, it's still the most thrilling, exciting moment, you know, the idea that, that I'm going to get to do that, mm -hmm. that I'm going to wear a pretty gown and sing some. You have it picked out already? Of course. All right. Said. <laughs> <laughs> this is Carnegie Hall. Right. <laughs> we'll just start real quickly. I want to do a little word association. Sure. When the first thing Ooh. you, when you, I say these things that come to your mind. Okay. Okay, so we'll do 88. Oh, love. Yeah. Mm, I loved 88. Okay. Yeah. It was, it was, it was my first cabaret home, you know. Yeah. Linda Carter. <laughs> Oh my God! She uh uh, uh worship. <laughs> oh oh come on! You're having Who a didn't moment here. Up and be Did you, woman? you ever spin? I, I, of course I spin. <laughs> spun. 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 <laughs> Spinning. No, oh, of course I spun. Oh okay. yeah no. And yes. meeting her was. Calm so down. Just have some water. <laughs> I, oh no! It was thrilling. It was really right. exciting. Uh, Harvard Westlake. Ah, well, it was Westlake School for Girls when I was there. Uh -huh. It had not um, blended, merged with uh, our brother school, which mm -hmm. was Harvard for boys, and that was on the other side of the canyon. Okay. And um, I loved Westlake. Uh -huh. I'm I'm a Westlake girl. Um, I loved going to a private school. I loved going to an all girls school. I formed really tight friendships uh, mm -hmm. with women. I I love women. I I. It was fantastic. It was mm -hmm. a great education, and I had fantastic teachers, and we had a blast. Okay. You know, and I even liked wearing uniforms. You know, I mean, I thought I looked extremely fetching in my uniform. <laughs> I didn't. We but must, I we must it. dig out a yearbook. <laughs> We're gonna get, oh, oh, find that footage. Yeah. Okay. And like, had eye glasses. Uh -huh. Oh yeah. Now a little song association. Okay. I know you love these artists. So the first song that comes to mind. Okay. All right. Okay. Nancy Wilson. Ooh. I was telling her about you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which you recorded. Yes, I did. Yeah. Nat King Cole. Oh, somewhere along the way. Ah, uh, it's one of those, there are these great songs post-World War II, and this is one of them, that um, I think really reflect the, the joy and the, you know, the post-war boom, but also this, this sort of underlying, bubbling, something's not quite right feeling that would erupt into the 60s and the 70s. Okay. You know, and that was the social upheaval that we saw. And that's one of those songs that I think 
is there. It's just this tiny free zone of, of something isn't quite right, but it's never named in the tune. And it's a glorious tune. It, it's about missing someone, you know, and I just love it. Linda Ronstadt. Oh, mmm. Ooh, there's so many. Uh, um, uh, oh, a long, long time. Okay. Oh. Aretha, Aretha Franklin. Oh, think. 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 Okay. Mm. The Eagles. Ooh, oh, there's so many. <laughs> life in the Fast Lane. All right. Yeah, Life in the Fast Lane. And, oh, yes. Okay. And finally, Ella Fitzgerald. Mmm. Oh. Her something to live for. All right. Yeah. Gorgeous. And after everything that you've accomplished and still accomplishing, is there anything that you would say you're the most proud of? Oh wow. Um. I guess uh, what touches me the most and and moves me the most is um, after performances when people tell me that they've been really moved, that they, that, that the music or the stories made them feel joy, or um, I recently did Freedom Songs at the Museum of Jewish Heritage, um, so there were people in the audience who are members of the museum that I didn't know, um, and there, a gentleman came to me and said that it made him feel hopeful um, for activism and for the future and for um, people caring about civil rights and caring about the um, sort of cross making bridges you know among the groups and not just sort of focused on what's germane to you not just women's rights or or uh, African American rights or you know but but caring about the rights of LGBT people or caring about the rights of uh, immigrants or you know that it just I I think knowing that people are getting what I'm really trying to put across. You know, that I used to say that, and I still believe that uh, w with music we make a soul-to-soul -soul connection that strips away sort of all of the trappings and all of the things that make us different. I mean, those things are great, and they're the flavor, you know, they're the spice in the stew, but um, with songs we can connect on just this pure soul human level. And so after a show when someone lets me know that I touch them in that way. That's just the greatest gift. I mean, it, it, it's, it's what I'm aiming to do. I, I want them to have a really good time, and I want people to leave feeling like they got something that lasts. So if someone tells me that that's true, that you know I, I reached my goal, I think that's probably what I'm proudest of, that, that um, I touched people in that way. A live performance is something so special. Well, I thank you for taking the time with me. No, my pleasure. And if you want to be touched by Natalie, <laughs> uh, <laughs> February 20th, Carnegie February 20th, Hall. Carnegie Hall. Uh, make sure you check it out. Yes, and, uh, back here at Birdland in uh, June, I think. You're, yeah. you're home away from home. Yes, we'll have a new show. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, doll.